All right, so I did this a little differently. I, I kind of looked at these three questions and this is the way that I organize how I uh, think about things. And this is what I'll start with and go from there as we go along. <clears throat> yes, I am autistic and I do research and evaluation of programs and of policies, so this is quite an invitation. When I think about the notion of neurodiversity and assessing whether it is evident in current ASD, Interventions, and if so, then to what degree, there is so much to consider, so much that I do see. I have come to the conclusion that it is very evident in current interventions, neurodiversity does present, in a sense that our best practices are really a reflection of how starved our current tactics are for some neurodiverse injection. When I look at interventions designed to teach or to support, it's unfortunate, but it's true, so I'm not sorry to report that a majority of interventions are at best misguided and at worst degrading, and they don't even try to hide it. Let's talk about misguided, because I think it's really common where goals and aims and programming are all what staff and mom want. It's not to say these humans don't have some good intentions, but most of you are operating from neurotypical conventions, from norms and your experience, from what you find effective. Ironically, it's all of you that need to learn to take perspective. Autistic people have different brains that are different in their wiring, and functioning in a same brain world is challenging and it's tiring. The world was made for NT brains and made by them too. The world was made by and for people with brains like you. Too much of current practice aims to make different look the same, but I assure you different things work better for supporting different brains. Believe it or not, there are different brain people who have been all the way through school. The neurodiverse and autistic communities should be our greatest tool. They have knowledge and experience. They share aspects of profiles with students who are in school now and they know what was worthwhile and what was damaging to them and what was so much better. So educational practices should be conceptualized together. If you think things have improved and there's truly collaboration between neurotypicals and autistics and all this positive innovation, then I ask you to consider the last time you, your class, your school, or district saw input about programming directly from autistics. If you don't know, or you know it's never, what evidence do you have then to say that things are much improved from the past and what they have been? Best practices have long been biased by a neurotypical mindset, and judgment of what progress is has been based on our compliance to norms and to the status quo, to make us look like you do, so that positive outcomes for autistics are essentially being untrue to who we are and how we think and our natural inclinations, and we know that this has very serious mental health implications. I saw a quote the other day by an autistic advocate asking educators to consider who does benefit from therapy and interventions. Is it the student who's supported, or is it you who feels so good when task completion has been rewarded? If it is the latter, I assure you change is likely needed. We can learn to act and pass, but that facade will always beat us. In the end, we fall apart because we have only learned to act. We haven't learned to navigate the world with our personhood intact. So why am I up here rhyming, putting all my thoughts in prose? It's really a perfect example of what my own past truly shows. I have always had an easier time expressing myself in writing, and rhyming provides a pattern scheme. There's comfort in the timing. So I think when I can focus on the structure and the flow, it eases my amped up energy around words and how to know if what I'm saying is what I mean and if I can portray it just as clear as in my head when out loud I need to say it. <laughs> so in school, I would often change assignments without asking, without permission. Like writing essays as rhyming poems was a commonplace decision. My teachers never told me I was being difficult or non-compliant. They encouraged it or built it in. I was creative, not rigid and defiant. This was so empowering, true to me I could complete the task, without going along to get along, without wearing a burdensome mask. It fit within the rubric, it was completed without a token, and the message I received was not that I was difficult or broken. Rhyming for a research panel is not the norm or expectation, but show of hands, who out there is still getting information? <laughs> you see, Differences aren't deficits, but we often treat them as they are, and interventions that focus on this will never take us far. Not you, not me, not kids today, not those who have endured it. And now I pass the mic, I'm out, and you can tell them where you heard it. <laughs> um, I would like to say
say that I yield after that. Um, I knew that was coming, and I'm talking after Jacqueline by design, um, mostly to admit that I do need to yield. Um, some of you may know that Jacqueline and I do have a partnership together. It's called Autism Level Up. It's our joint venture um, in all things autism <laughs> and um, consulting and thinking about um, advancement in the field. Um, and I can honestly say it is some of the best work that I have ever done. Um, and I say that having a significant history of working in the field, both in research and in development of educational practices. Um, and it's the partnership that's been truly enlightening to me, to be able to work day in and day out with the neurodiverse perspective. Now, um, I can say that I didn't know how much I was missing before, even though I thought I was informed, um, that I thought I was being conscientious, that I was respectful. And I was all of those things, but I was at a different level than I am now. Um, and even before we formed this partnership, I have plenty of autistic friends. I've worked with many families with autistic children. Um, but this true collaboration has taken my work to an entirely different place. Um, now, with that being said, yes, I am also the co-author of the CERTS model, and I will say that that intervention model in and of itself was designed to embrace neurodiversity, and neurodiversity as we knew it when we wrote it, and as a place for where we need to grow, right? So as more information comes to light, more research comes to light in terms of different learning styles, in terms of different um, brains, that we're incorporating that in our intervention and helping those children to uncover who they truly are and be able to navigate the world and have the tools that they need to be able to do so. Um, so I will say again that certs, I will, if we go back and look at those questions, you know, it, it is grounded in the embracing of neurodiversity. We often talk about certs being um, initiated around Barry Prasant's dissertation in the 1970s when he looked at the functions of echolalia and said, this isn't psychotic speech, it isn't something that needs to be extinguished, it's something that demonstrates a different learning style and something to be worked with. And I think that's where CERTS really has its roots is honoring and understanding the differences in the learning styles of autistic individuals and moving forward with those. I'm also very excited as more research is coming out now about helping us understand these different learning styles and these different um, ways of being that we can infuse that, incorporate that, and certs and levels certs up to that next place too. Could, could you please, Amy, just tell a little bit about certs? There may be people in the audience that don't are familiar with the sure. program. Sure. I just assume that everybody no. knows about the breath minute. No, what? <laughs> Um, so CERTS is a model of intervention. It is one of the naturalistic developmental behavioral interventions that um, Dr. Ramsey was referencing. Um, it's kind of part of this group of interventions. Um, and it has four co-authors. Dr. Barry Prasant, who is a speech and language pathologist. Dr. Amy Weatherby, who's a distinguished research chair at Florida State University, also a speech language pathologist. Emily Rubin, who is the education outreach coordinator at Marcus Autism Center, also a speech language pathologist myself, who is an OT um, and a developmental psychologist. Um, it is a, a collaborative model. It's a transactional model that looks at scaffolding social communication and emotional regulation development in children um, and adults um, through the use of transactional support. So we're constantly working within the transactional interaction between a child or an individual and their environment and helping um, the child develop or the individual develop new skills in communication regulation, but also improving the types of supports that are around the child so that we can scaffold um, those skills or abilities for them. 